Good day, Great Tolls. Welcome to this next lesson where we will be going through papers one and two, obviously exam revision. And we're going to start where we left off. We were busy going to about to do this question on geometry, um, circle geometry to be specific. Okay, so it says, complete the statement of the following theorem. If two triangles are equ equiangular, Hmm, sorry, I'm just realizing my pen's on. There we go. If two triangles are equiangular, then their corresponding sides are, and the two triangles are similar. If two triangles are equiangular, then the correspondings are in proportion. They are in proportion. Okay, because we're talking about similarity here. We are not talking about um, correct. Um, congruency. So therefore, the corresponding sides are in proportion. Okay. And the two triangles are similar. Now, the reason that they're mentioning this is because we're probably going to have to use similarity and ratio and proportion in our questions. And oh, look, he has some nice ratio and proportion questions. So let's have a look. It says in the figure below, AB. AB is a tangent to the circle with center at O. Okay. AC, AC equals AO. So AC equals AO. These two are equal in length. And BA is parallel to CE. DC is produced to B. Okay. So now it says, if A4 equals X, this one here, if it equals X, determine with reasons three other angles equal to X. Okay, well, first of all, let's change color. First of all, do you agree that this angle here equals X? Because these angles are alternate. So I can say angle C2 equals x, y because they're alternate angles, okay? C2 is also equal to D2 because they are both subtended by AE. So C2 is subtended by AE and so is D2. So therefore D2 is equal to x, y equal angles subtended by same chord. Okay. Right. So therefore, this is X. Okay. And then, do you agree that that there is a tangent and that's a chord? So therefore, D1 is equal to X because the tan chord theorem. There is my X. There is my tangent. There is my chord, so therefore we can say that D1 is equal to X. So D1 is equal to X, and the reason would be the tan chord theorem. Okay, now it says prove that triangle, let's get another color before we do this. Um, let's choose green. Prove the triangle ACF, ACF. So we need to prove that that triangle there, ACF, is similar to triangle ADC, ADC. Okay, so I need another color. Let's use this one. ADC. Okay, so let's write it down. We've got in triangle, what do they want? ACF, ACF, and triangle ADC, ADC. Do you agree that angle A is common? A is common. That makes life a little bit easier, right? We also know that in triangle ACF, C2 or C is equal to X, okay? But in the orangey yellowy triangle, ADG, ADG, DD is equal to X proved above. 
Therefore, this angle here is equal to that angle. So we can say C is equal to D proved above. Okay, therefore, triangle ACF is similar to triangle ADG. Why? Be angle, 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 why? Because the third angle has to be equal to the other angle for the simple reason that it's angle sum of triangle. So in other words, the whole of this angle has to equal that angle there. So F has to equal C um, in this, sorry, what is this? That's ADC, is C. Um, for the simple reason, the angle sum of triangle, and I've made it look like they are right angles when they don't necessarily have to be right angles. So let's just fix that and just change it to like that. Okay, right now, now what do they say? Now they're saying, I still haven't proved that you use anything to do with AC and AO. Hmm. Anyway, now it says prove that AF, they want us to prove, required to prove, that AF is equal to AO squared over AD. Okay, so they want us to prove that AO squared is equal to, and they're looking at AF and AD. Now we've just proven that these two triangles are similar. Okay, and they've also told us that AC equals AO. Okay, so do you agree that instead of saying AO squared, I could probably rewrite this as AC squared over AD. Okay, then do you agree that I'm saying that AF multiplied by AD is equal to AC squared? Okay. Or I could be saying that I could divide both of these by AC. And then I would be going, well, in that case, one of those goes away with that. So, and then I could take one of these top things to the other side. It doesn't matter which one. So I could say, okay, fine. Maybe we need to be proving that AF over AC is in proportion to AC over a D and then we go look at the triangles we've just proven and we can see that there's an AF and an AC and yeah there's an AC over AD so actually now that we've worked out what we had to prove it is pretty obvious that since these two triangles are similar and we've got them in the right order we can actually do this this is how easy this question now is Okay, so you needed to see that AO was the same as AC, okay? So you could have written it exactly what I've done now. I could have written it exactly as I've done and just write in your given because it was given, okay? And then you can say, um, so this is what's required to prove. This is all that's required, required to prove. Then you could say, Triangle ACF is similar to triangle ADC. Angle, angle, angle proved above. Okay. Therefore, AF over AC has to equal AC over AD because of the fact that they are similar triangles. And that's it. You're done. That's it. That's the end of this question. The big thing was to realize that AO squared was the same as AC squared because they told you that. The other big thing was to rearrange it so that you had an AC in both sides. And if you look over here, you can see that was the clue. There was an AC here and an AC here. And the third thing was to realize that if they're asking you to prove similarity here, and then over here, they're asking you ratio and proportion there's a 99.99% chance that you are going to be needing to use that question there. Okay, I mean, yeah. Okay, so that's done. Easy peasy. Right, now we're going to move back on to our maths paper one.
Okay, so let's get going. The first question, this is an old IB exam paper question, just for the record. Um, I chose it simply because IB's actually got a very good standard of questions. Um, I'm not saying the government don't, it's just nice for a change to have a different look at a type of questions. They've got exact, almost identical curriculum. There are only like one or two things that are slightly different. Um, so it's actually very nice to have a look at a different curriculum and get an idea of um, different types of questions that you could possibly get. Okay, so let us have a look at this. So it says, solve for x, 2x squared plus 11 equals x plus, 20, plus 21. So first thing I'm going to do is get everything onto the one side. So I've got 2x squared plus 11 minus x minus 21 equals 0. Okay, so then I'm going to add the like terms. So I've got 2x squared minus x, and I've got plus 11 minus 21, which is minus 10 equals 0. So that now looks like a trinomial. Do you agree? We've got the factors of the first term are 2 and 1. The factors of the last term are 10 and 1, 1 and 10, 5 and 2, and 2 and 5. Well, it's obviously not going to be the 10s and 1s because we don't want a difference of 1. But 2 times 2 is 4, and 1 times 5 is 5, and if I add 4 and minus 5, I get minus 1. So therefore, I need to put the minus in front of the 5, and I do have opposite signs, which is what this requires. So we end up with 2x minus 5, x plus 2, because remember you write it across equals 0. So x is equal to 5 over 2 or x is equal to negative 2. There you go. And that wasn't so bad, hey? Right, so now let's look at this one. Okay, we've got 3x cubed plus x squared minus x equals 0. And what I'm hoping you will realize is that immediately you can take out a common factor of x. And you're left with 3x squared plus x minus 1 equals 0. And this question is a little bit of a tricky question. They're being mean. And the reason they're being mean is because they're going to assume that a majority of students are going to divide by x and then they're not going to realize that one of the solutions is x equals 0. That is one of the solutions. x equals 0 or 3x squared plus x minus 1 equals 0. So now what do we do? need to do? We need to obviously factorize this. So we've got the factors of 3 are 3 and 1, and the factors of 1 are 1 and 1. And we're never going to get a difference of 1 here. Do you agree? Because 3 times 1 is 3 and 1 times 1 is 1 is going to be 2. So what do we need to do? We now need to use our formula. And the formula is x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So if we substitute that in, we get x, let's try again, x equals minus 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared is 1 minus 4 times by 3 times by the whole of this because the whole of this is c so it's minus 1 all over 2 times 3. So we get minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 Minus times a minus is a plus. 4 times 3 is 12, all over 6. Therefore, x is equal to minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 13 over 6, which is equal to what? We're going to have to use our calculator, so let's get out the calculator. And we clear this, and we go negative 1 minus the square root of 13 equals divided by 6 
equals, and that's a very useful answer. So it's minus 0 0.77, assuming we're rounding off to two decimal places. So it's minus 0 0.77 minus 0.77 or, and now we do the other version. I wonder if we can go up, let's see. There it is. So, and then we're gonna go back, delete and go plus, and we go equals, and then we go divided by six, and it gives you a very intelligent answer again. 0.43 or 0.43. So, all very well that you had to use the formula and everything else, but the trick of this question was actually that you didn't disregard that x equals zero as one of the options. Okay, so now let us look at this question here. It says we're solving for x, okay? We're solving for x, and it says state any restrictions, okay? So, do you agree the first thing that we're going to do? I'm trying to decide if I should multiply out. Yeah, we're going to have to multiply out. So, we've got 2x plus p is equal to px plus 2p. Now, we get everything with the x onto one side and everything without an x onto the other side. So, we've got 2x minus px is equal to 2p plus p. No, it's a minus because I've taken it across. So do you agree we can take out a common factor of x and we're left with 2 minus p over 2p minus p is what? It is just p. So therefore, do you agree that x equals p over 2 minus p? But they say stating in restrictions, which gives you a clue. And the clue is that obviously we can't be dividing by zero. Therefore, 2 minus p cannot equal zero. Therefore, minus p cannot equal negative 2. Therefore, p cannot equal 2. Don't worry about the fact that this says does not equal. You're basically doing the same type of sum. You're just writing does not equal instead of equals. Okay. Right. Let's move on to the next question. It says write down the next term of the number pattern. Okay. So let's have a look at this. We've got a half, 8 over 9, 27 over 28. Hmm. Okay, do you see the top? If we look just at the top, do you see that it becomes, um, well, first of all, if we look at the top and the bottom, do you see that this is one more than this? Nine is one more than this. 20, 28 is one more than 27. So whatever that this is going to be, this is going to be one more than that, okay? And this is quite interestingly, one cubed is one, 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, so this is going to be 4 cubed, which is, I think, 64. 4, 4 is a 16 times, yeah, 64. 64 over, and then obviously this has to be in, I mean, sorry, I'm thinking in ends. It's going to be 1 plus 64, which is going to be 60. So your next term is going to be 64 divided by 65. It's a nice question, this. Okay, just for the record, if we'd asked for this, do you agree that it would be n cubed? And this answer would be n cubed plus 1. That would be the general term. Do you see it? Okay, this is 1 squared, and that's 1 squared plus 1. 1 cubed and 1 cubed plus 1. This is 2 cubed and 2 cubed plus 1. This is 3 cubed and 3 cubed. So therefore, the nth term would be n cubed over n cubed plus 1. Very nice question, that one. Okay, let's look at this one. It says, given 2, 6, and k, write down the value of k if the sequence is arithmetic or geometric. Okay, so do you agree if it's arithmetic, we've got t2 minus t1 has to equal t3 minus 
T2, okay? In other words, there's a common difference. So the difference between these two is four. So the difference between these two would be four again. So in this case, K would equal 10, okay? Whereas if it was geometric, we'd have two, six, K, where K divided by two had to equal six divided by Sorry, let's try again. K divided by six. Blah. K divided by six is equal to six divided by two. But six divided by two is just three. So what's K going to equal? K is going to equal six times three, which is 18. So therefore, the correct answer here is 18. Ah, now it says evaluate the sum of the infinite series. Okay, grade 12s, what do you need to realize? You need to realize that you're looking at the sum of an infinite series. And in order to evaluate the sum of an infinite series, you need to realize that this is a GP. Okay, and the sum goes, the formula for the sum is sum to infinity is equal to one minus R over A, I think. I'm going blank. Um, hang on a minute. But before we carry on with that, I wonder why I've gone blank on the sum to infinity. I'll come back to it in a second. Okay, first of all, we need to establish that this is a GP. And in order to, for this to be a GP, we need to go T3 divided by T2 and find out if it equals T2 divided by T1. So let's call this equation 1, this 2, this 3, and this 4. And then let us see if they actually are the same. Um, okay, so let's have a look. So do you agree that T2 would be 3 comma 3 6 over 5 comma 6. So let's go see what that formula is. Oh, I was being silly. Sum to infinity equals A over 1 minus R. Definitely. I don't know why I decided to do it the other way around. Okay, so let's see what this formula is. I mean, what this works out to be. So let's work this out. It's 3.36. Mm -hmm. 3.36 divided by 5.6 equals 3 fifths. So this equals 3 fifths, okay? Now, if this also equals 3 fifths, then we've got a sum to infinity, easy peasy, that we can solve using geometric series, okay? So now what we're going to do is 2 comma 0, 1, 6 divided by 3 comma 3, 6. So let's look at that one. Um, so let's do that. So if we do that, we have got 2.016 divided by 3.36 equals 3 fifths as well. Yay, that equals 3 fifths. Okay, so do you see we've got 3 fifths here and 3 fifths there, three fifths here and three fifths there. So therefore, we can realize that the, there's a common ratio of three fifths. So now it's really easy to find the sum to infinity. The sum to infinity is equal to five comma six, the first term, over one minus three fifths, okay? Which we can go as five comma six divided by two fifths, okay? Because one minus three fifths is two fifths. So what do we have? We have 5.6 divided by, and let's make it a fraction, 2 over 5 equals, and it works out to be 14. So the sum to infinity is equal to 14. So don't freak out if you see funny numbers like that. It's really not a big deal if you see funny numbers, okay? You gain to get the right answer if you just work through the steps. Okay, let's do the next question. So the next question states, given naught, minus one, one, six, and 14, show that the sequence has a constant second difference. So obviously, therefore, we're talking about um, 
<coughs> a quadratic sequence. Okay, so let's have a look at it. Let's write it out. We've got naught, minus 1, 1, 6, and 14. Do you agree that the first difference is minus 1, minus 0, which is minus 1? The second difference is going to be 1 minus minus 1, which is 2. The third, this point, sorry, it's not the second difference. This, this difference here is going to be 6 minus 1, which is 5. And this difference is 14 minus 6, which is 8. Okay, so do you agree the difference here is 3, the difference here is 3, the difference here is 3. So yay, we've just shown that the sequence has this constant second difference. Now to determine a simplified expression for the nth term of the sequence. Okay, we can do this. So first of all, do you agree that the second difference is considered to be 2a? This is considered to be 3a plus b, and the first term is a plus b plus c. And that way we work out the coefficients for an squared plus bn plus c, where we're looking for the simplified expression of the nth term. Okay, so 2a equals 3, therefore we can say a is equal to 3 over 2, right? Because 2a equals 3, therefore a is going to be 3 over 2. We're now going to take that and substitute it into here. So we've got 3 times 3 over 2 plus b is equal to negative 1. So I can take that and I can go, well, we've got 3 times 3 is 9. So we've got 9 over 2 plus b equals minus 1. Now we can solve for b. I'm going to write up here. So I've got b is equal to minus 1 minus 9 over 2. The common denominator is 2. So I've got minus 2 minus 9, which is minus 11 over 2. Hmm. So now, what do I have? So if I've got a is 3 over 2, I've got b is minus 11 over 2, and we need to find c. Okay, so we know that a plus, c, a plus, a plus b plus c equals 0, so we can substitute that in. So I'm just going to erase a little bit of stuff here so that I've got space to write. We don't need the second difference anymore. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So let's change this and write in purple. So we've got A, which is 3 over 2, plus B, which is minus 11 over 2, plus C has to equal 0. So do you agree that 3 minus 11 is minus 8? So minus 8 over 2 plus C equals 0, so that becomes minus 4. So minus 4 plus C equals 0, so C is going to equal 4. Hmm. So now, so now we know that that's 4. 4. So now we can write out an equation, a nice simplified expression. And I need space to write, so I'm just going to erase this quickly. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, we've got Tn is equal to An squared. So Tn is equal to 3 over 2N squared minus 11 over 2N plus 4. But they said determine a simplified expression. No, that's it. There's nothing else I can do. That's the answer. Cha-ching! There we go. We're done. Okay, now it says find the 30th term. That's very easy. All you're going to do is substitute 30 wherever you see an n. So that becomes 3 over 2 times by 30 squared minus 11 over 2 times by 30 plus 4. So therefore it's 3 over 2 times by 900 minus 11 times by 15 plus 4. That cancels, that becomes a 1, so that becomes 300 minus, I do not know what 11, okay, I can work it out, it's 165, minus 165 plus 4. So what we're going to do is just get our calculator and do the rest. So it's 300 minus 165 
plus 4 equals 139. So that equals 139. And there you go. That is the 30th term. 30th term is 139. Okay. Right. Let's look at the next example. Okay, so this is kind of a weird graph, okay? Do you agree it's not anything that we're used to seeing? We're used to seeing um, things like parabolas and straight lines without funny things on them, okay? All that they're doing here is testing your understanding. So do not panic about the fact that this is a type of thing that we have not seen before. All that they want to do is test your understanding of domain and range and graphs, okay? But now if you look very carefully, you can see that this is an open circle. That's an open circle. Then you've got a straight line going up to this point and then it's curvy, okay? And then this bit here is a closed circle. Okay, so the first thing they ask us to do is the domain and range. So do you agree the domain are the values that are on the x-axis, across the x-axis, for which this graph is valid? Okay, so therefore do you agree the domain is going to be x is smaller than or equal to 4, because it starts at 4, and it's going to just be bigger than minus 3, because it doesn't include the minus 3, because that's an open circle. Okay, so that there is your domain. 4x is an element of real values. There you go. There's your domain. Okay, let's do the range. The range is going to be from where it ends to where it starts. So, or whatever you want to call it. So the y has to be smaller than or equal to 3 and greater than or equal to minus 3 again. Okay, but you'll notice it can equal minus 1 on this side, even though it doesn't that side, so it's fine. And it's y is an element of real value. So that is the range. This is the range, and this is the domain. Okay, now it says use the graph to determine the values of x for which f of x is greater than 0. So they want to know for which values of x which f of x is greater than 0. In other words, the y values. They want to know which values of x is this graph above the x-axis? That's all they want. So do you agree it's above the x-axis from minus 2 to 3? So therefore it would be for x is smaller than 3, not equal to, because then it would be equal to 0, and bigger than minus 2. That is the answer for question 2. Okay. Now it says, use the graph to determine the values of x for which f dashed of x is smaller than 0. Okay, so that's an interesting question because what is f dashed of x? f dashed of x is the slope. It's the gradient, right? It's the first derivative, but it represents the slope or the gradient, okay? So what they're saying is they want to know when is this graph got a negative gradient? And do you agree from here to here, it's got a positive gradient? But this year, from th this value here, all the way here, it's actually sloping up to the left, which means it's got a negative gradient. So therefore, it has got a negative gradient from x is smaller than 4. Okay, they just want smaller than, so therefore it's smaller than 4. Or bigger than... Sorry, I just want to erase something. Or bigger than 1. Okay, bigger than 1. And it can equal 4 because it still has a negative gradient there. But it cannot equal 1 because there the gradients change. It goes from a very positive gradient to a very negative gradient. So it changes. And then finally it says determine... Okay, let's change this to black. They just say determine f of f of 3. Okay, they want you to determine the function of the function of 3. In other words, they want you to find where, what this graph's value is when x equals 3, and then find the y value. So, f of 3. Do you agree is what? f of 3 is 0. 
So f of 3 is 0. So therefore, f of 0 is going to be 2. It's a nice sneaky question here. They want you to find the y value when x equals 3, which is 0, and then make that the x value for the, func for the actual function. So it's f of 0, which equals 2. Okay, so this type of question is kind of an anomaly. They've put it in, and it's a very nice question as far as I'm concerned. They've put it in to test your understanding of graphs and functions and not necessarily to test a specific graph or a specific function. And I think it's very good to make sure that you can understand to do this type of question, not because I assume that every paper you get from now on will have this type of question, but if you can do this type of question, you definitely can do graphs. Okay, let's have a look. Now it says, refer to the equation of this, I mean, refer to the figure of a hyperbola. Okay, so hyperbolas. Hyperbolas graph is f of x is equal to what? Okay, it's normally equal to k over x, but now we change it because it's been shifted and shifted. So if it becomes a over x plus I don't know, P plus Q. That is what the graph is, and it's plus or minus and plus or minus, obviously. This is the graph of what we are looking at now. We're looking at a graph that has been shifted over and shifted up, okay? And then we have to find the values of A. So first of all, let's look at Q. Q is the easy one, because this graph has obviously been, obviously been shifted up Two, but two, two units because usually the horizontal asymptote is the x-axis, okay? So therefore we know that f of x is equal to a over x plus p plus 2, okay? And now the p, the easy way to remember it is that if this is moved over to minus 3, p becomes plus 3. If this is moved over to plus 3, this would be minus 3. But what you really need to understand is what you're doing with this value is adding what the difference is to get it back to where it started. So in other words, what would I need to add to this to get it back up to the original asymptote? I would have to add plus 3. So therefore, this becomes a over x plus 3 plus 2, that's f of x. Right, now finally, we need to find the value of A. Okay, so we need to choose any random point and substitute it in and get a value. But you will notice that the only random point we've got on this is the x-axis that it's going through. So we are going to have to substitute in 0, 0 into that equation to find the value of A. So let's do it. So y-axis is 0, I mean the y-value is 0, is equal to a over 0 plus 3 plus 2, okay? So do you agree that becomes minus 2 is equal to a over 3? Because when I take that plus 2 across, it becomes minus. I'm now going to multiply both sides by 3 to get rid of the denominator. So therefore, I get minus 6 equals a. And I like that answer because this, these two graphs are in the negative quadrants. So therefore, I should have got a negative equation for my graph. So my final graph is f of x is equal to minus 6 over x plus 3 plus 2. There you go. That's how easy that is. Okay, right. Now let's look at the next question. It says g of x is equal to 3x squared minus 7. Let's rewrite that, okay? g of x is equal to 3x squared minus 7. It says it is shifted 3 units down and 2 units to the left, giving h of x. And it says determine the expression of h of x in the form ax squared plus bx plus, minus, plus c. Okay, so first of all, do you agree that we need to shift this down? And that's the easy bit, because all we're going to do is subtract this. So we're going to go minus 3. We're shifting it down, so we're shifting this whole graph down by 3. Now we have to shift it to 2 units to the left. 
Okay, so let's think about this. Two units to the left is towards the negative side. But remember, just as I showed you here, if we move the graph two units to the left towards the negative, what do we do? We add the value, okay? So that's what we're going to do here. This becomes equals 3x plus 2 all squared and then it's minus 10 because it's minus 7 minus 3. But now they've said, and this is h of x, okay, but now they've said they want it in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c, which means we need to multiply this out and make it look pretty. So that becomes 3x squared plus 2x times by 2 is 4x plus 4 minus 10 which becomes 3x squared plus 12x plus 12 minus 10, which becomes 3x squared plus 12x plus 2. Okay, so there you go. Um, there aren't that many transformations um, in the current exam paper, so you don't have to stress about this too much. But now at least you know um, if you, if you want to be able to know how to do it, you can. Right, that's it for today. We will continue working through all the exam paper questions. Please feel free to send me any exam paper questions that you want done and we will work through them. Have a great day.